Adhikarna 10. No remnant of virtue even. Under the previous topic, it was ascertained on the authority of the scriptures that when knowledge dawns, it causes the non-attachment and destruction of all potential results of works that are naturally calculated to cause bondage. But a doubt may arise that the virtuous deeds do not come into conflict with the knowledge arising from the scriptures since they also originate from the same source. Taking this doubt into consideration, the reasoning of the previous topic is being extended here with a view to dispelling it. Sutra 14 Itarasyapyevam asangshlesha pate tu Itarasya of the other, that is, of virtue. Api also Evam, in this way, asangshlesha, there is no contact. To surely liberation comes. Pate, when the body falls. Translation. In the very same way, there is no attachment of the other, that is, of virtue, as well. Liberation must follow as soon as the body falls. To the man of knowledge occur the non-attachment and destruction of the other as well, of virtue also, as of sin itself. Why? Since that may put obstacles in the path of the fruition of knowledge, for that, virtue, too, is productive of its own result. In the Upanishadic texts like, He conquers both of them, Brihadaranyaka 4.4.22, the destruction of virtue, just as much as of vice, is declared, since the destruction of action consequent on the realization of the self that is not an agent occurs equally in the cases of both virtuous and vicious acts, and since the Upanishad speaks of the destruction of all works without any exception in, and all one's actions become dissipated. Mundakopanishad 2.2.8. Even where the single word vice is used, the word virtue is also to be understood because its result is inferior to that of knowledge. Moreover, in the Upanishad itself occurs the word vice to convey the idea of virtue as well. Thus, in the sentence, day and night cannot reach this barrage, which is the self. Chandogyopanishad 8. 4. 1. Virtue is introduced along with vice. Then it is said, All sins desist from it, the self, ibidu, thereby using the word sin, vice, to indicate virtue as well without any distinction. In pate tu, the word tu, literally but, is used to imply emphasis. The text emphasizes the fact that since virtue and vice causing bondage are thus shown to become separated and destroyed by the power of knowledge, liberation must come to the man of enlightenment when his body falls. Namaste. So the release from sinful karma is understandable because that's obviously a cause of bondage and conditioning in material existence. But what about virtuous acts? What about good karma? Doesn't one keep the results of good karma after enlightenment? Because after all, the uh, works that create good karma are prescribed in the scriptures, along with the knowledge that leads to liberation. So wouldn't it be natural to retain those good results? No. Brahma Sutra says no. No, in fact, 
the Upanishads often use one for the other. They mention pious activities and imply the existence of impious activities as well, or the reverse. He cites several examples where the one term includes both. Why is that? Because any karma, bad or good, is attachment, is bondage, is continued term of material existence. For example, if one has to, uh, for example, become a demigod by virtue of accumulated good karma, well, that will stop liberation because demigods are part of the material world and they have to believe in the material world so that they can do their jobs. Huh? How could you be a demigod and be in charge of, you know, rain or something like that and not believe that it's real? But one who attains liberation is firmly convinced, in fact, it's obvious to him, that this material world is illusion. It doesn't really exist. It only seems to exist because it's a projection overlaid on Brahman. This is called avyaya, or superimposition. So, superimposition means that one thing is taken for another, like the rope and the snake. Huh? So, in the same way, what seems to be good karma is actually just as binding as bad karma. So we really want to get rid of them both. We don't want to retain the results of any of our material activities, good or bad, because we know that these are causes of bondage. They make it necessary to take birth and to perform so many activities to experience the results. And we don't want that. We want to be free. So we also reject the results of good karma. Now, that may mean that we live in a very simple way, uh, that we don't become, you know, very wealthy or powerful or famous or whatever. But that's all right. <laughs> it's okay. We don't want that. Because if we do then we become entangled in all these material relationships and activities. And that would nullify the effect of liberation. And of course, we're not going to do that. Because once you attain liberation, that's it. So someone may say, but we still see that the great sages, such as Ramana Maharshi, Chandrasekhar Indra, Saraswati, Vyasadeva himself, or to speak of kings like Janaka and uh, great sages like Yajnavalkya, uh, they continued with all kinds of activities even after liberation. Well, what's up with that? Aren't they experiencing the results of previous karma? For example, uh, Janaka was a great king. He was the emperor of the whole Indian continent. In those days, India was much, much more extensive than it is today. It reached all the way to Burma and Indonesia in the east and even parts of southern China. And in the west, it may have reached even to eastern Europe, the Balkans and so on. So he was a great king, a great emperor, and he was also liberated on account of his association with Yagyavalkya. So did he step down? Did he go to the forest? Did he give up his royal robes and so on? No, no. He stayed in his position and he executed the duties of a Vedic king perfectly. So how is this possible? Well, the karma 
applies to the body. It does not apply to the being. So when the being realizes, I am not this body, then the karma may continue to be acted out by the body. But the self within knows, I am not this. And not only that, the karma that would result in future lives is completely wiped out. Only the prarabdha karma, the fructifying karma that is due in this particular lifetime, in this particular body, is experienced by the body. The jivan mukta doesn't experience it at all. Now, this is why Ramana Maharshi, for example, even though he had cancer and the body was suffering a great deal, was not disturbed at all. He would say things like, yeah, death is just a thought. You know, suffering is just a thought. And why should I be hung up on these thoughts? That's the point. Why, after liberation, should one continue to believe in the truth of name and form? And karma and time and bodies and the whole thing, you know, the whole package. <laughs> because now one is free. And when you are free, when you're in the Brahma Loka, then all desires are naturally satisfied as a matter of course. We'll see later on in this chapter, in the fourth pada, that freedom, liberation, moksha, means one lives in the world of Saguna Brahman and gets the result of all kinds of desires immediately. As long as there is any residual desire, then it is immediately satisfied. One may take several bodies or many bodies of different types and perform all kinds of activities in them. Because, after all, we are Brahman. And Brahman's first trick was to become many, right? <laughs> so, when we're in the fully liberated state after the demise of the present body, then we have automatically all the powers of Brahman, except perhaps uh, to create or destroy the material creation. But everything else we have. So this is the nature of the soul, that he is not attached to these bodily karmas, huh? these bodily desires and activities. But he's detached and when he goes to the spiritual world, any desire that might still be there is immediately satisfied and quashed. So one remains in one's natural state of sat chit ananda. This is liberation. Aum tatsa. Aum shakti aum. Aum namah shivaya.